All right. Well, good day, everyone. Thanks for joining us again for the Garden Hour. Always happy to have you join us and uh, to answer your questions and to highlight other things that we're seeing in gardens uh, across the state of Missouri. So always happy to have you here. Um, we do have a network of MU horticulture specialists across the state of Missouri, and we're always happy to help you out. Um, we have a coverage map here with uh, highlighted counties that folks cover. So if you haven't reached out to your local horticulture specialist, um, feel free to jot down their email there. We'll also show this slide at the end of the garden hour, uh, but we're always happy to help um, answer your questions and, and learn more about what's going on in the garden. Uh, if you're joining us via Zoom, I just wanted to let you know that we also live stream on YouTube. Uh, and we have a great YouTube channel, uh, the MUIPM YouTube channel that has all of the full length versions of the Garden Hour, as well as some weekly snippets that we kind of pick out as highlights from, from that week. And at that, I am going to go ahead and hand it over to our weatherman, uh, Dr. Tony Lupo. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, let's uh, let's talk a little weather and let's be a little shorter this week. I've, I'm getting a little bit long and some of this is getting a little bit repetitive. So let's uh, let's talk weather, but uh, let's get through it. Um, again, the temperatures have been pretty warm for this time of year. It's the summertime now. Uh, today is the longest day of the year, so enjoy it. And uh, one thing that continues to happen is our dew points tend to be a little low for this time of year, which means that we're seeing increased evaporation and uh, any rain that we get just evaporates out and we're, uh, we're just kind of limping along, as I said last week. Uh, aloft, I'm worried that uh, we're seeing the emergence of a reemergence of a strong summertime ridge. I hope that's not going to occur, but we'll see. We'll see. The next few days will tell the tale. Um, I, I'll skip over this one because it's basically re repeating a lot of what we've seen in the last few weeks, so uh, that's not a problem. The drought monitor hasn't changed much, maybe a little worse up here in the northern part of Missouri than it was last week, so um, again, it's uh, more of that rain has been south of I-30, uh, Route 36. You go around the state and you see that the temperatures have been very close to normal or unless you're in the southern part of the state, well below normal for summer uh, or for June so far. And that precipitation, like I said last week, we're kind of limping along for June pretty close to normal for most places and we're not losing too much ground. Uh, what's changed in the last week? The pattern I showed last week that's weakening continues to weaken. So that's, that's a little bit of good news and it's showing that the pattern is doing what I said last week. It's changing to be a little bit more favorable. So let me skip over this and we'll show the what's expected for the next week, wet to our north and west, wet to our south and east. And for Missouri, the best chances of rain are gonna be Saturday, Sunday, and gonna be below the uh, I-70 corridor and up into the I-70 corridor, a little bit up north, but not as much as we need. And again, we've been getting this hit and miss during weekends. A new summer outlook has been released. And again, it's, uh, it's mildly encouraging. As we said last week, temperatures haven't, aren't uh, projected to be as warm as they could be for this time of year, maybe shading a bit above normal and precipitation above normal for the next two months. Or at least there's the odds are that it will be. And uh, that will, again, keep us limping along a uh, six to 10 day outlook, uh, Texas is roasting. We may get a little bit of heat uh, later this week, but not too much. And precipitation should stay 
pretty close to normal for next week. Weeks three to four show equal chances and equal chances means they don't have a good handle on things. So uh, again, eh, I would think it's going to be uh, much of the same temperature wise that we've been seeing. And this is actually not too bad a news with the precip because uh, we see these two areas of above normal precip and that may reflect on us a little bit, keep us limping along. If you're not part of Cocoraz, please join Cocoraz. We could use your measurements. Um, the Seymour reports, if you uh, have the ability to go to climate, dot missouri dot edu and submit a seymour report that's used by the drought monitor uh, to look at conditions across the state thank you to missouri we done did well as i say here unfortunately because it's been hot and dry soil moisture as expected is pretty low right now and uh, at the four inch mark below the soil and i think that Everybody kind of realizes that at this point. Um, today and for the next few days, uh, sunny, warm, high in the upper 80s to near 90, uh, and then 90 to lower 90s on Friday. Today, if you live in the southern part of the state, and I notice that we're seeing some showers already in southeast Missouri, you may get some hit and miss there today. But the rest of the week, not much to speak of. Our best chance again is Saturday, Sunday. Uh, highs in the low 90s and mid 90s for most of the state. Uh, Saturday nights, the best chance of scattered showers and thunderstorms with lows in the 60s. And then Sunday, again, thunderstorms diminishing and warm high in the mid 90s. And then for next week, we go back to the sunshine. So it seems like we're stuck in this. Weekends are the best chance of rain, sunshine during the week. Any questions? All right. Well, thanks so much, right. Tony, for joining us. Um, I appreciate, always appreciate the weather report. Uh, and I know we can't blame the weather on you. But I always like to know what's uh, what's coming up. Well, well, if I could control the weather, I'd have retired. So, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> um, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer Shooter, who will be our moderator for today. Thank you, Justin. And we'll start with our first question, and it is: I attended the Great Gardens Conference in Hannibal two weeks ago. And during discussions about transforming an area into a wildflower plot or meadow, the pros specifically said to not use black plastic as it heats up the soil to a temperature that harms the soil organisms or biome. What does the science say? And Justin is going to answer that question. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, soil ecology and microbiology, it's a very interesting topic. Um, if you're into that stuff, there's a really good uh, book called The Soil Food Web Primer. Uh, but let's dive into this question a little bit more. Um, so when we think of mulch, uh, inorganic mulches, we generally put those into two categories. Uh, so black plastic mulch is extruded polyethylene. They dye it with carbon, so it's black. Um, it's mostly impervious, um, so rainfall won't go through, but there can be some vapor exchange uh, from the soil. It's generally used with subsurface drip irrigation that's laid down prior to uh, establishment of the beds or at the same time. Generally used uh, in annual systems like vegetable crops, um, and it, depending on how thick it, it is, it might survive more than one season, but um, generally not very long-lived product. Uh, landscape fabric, on the other hand, uh, which we more commonly see 
uh, for non-annual or perennial plantings uh, can come in a woven fabric that oftentimes has these green lines on it, which can help you with spacing. Uh, but there's also spun polyester materials. Um, there is some permeability. Um, it's not going to be the same as rain falling on bare soil. Uh, but there is some infiltration of the rainfall there. This stuff is deline, uh, pardon me, designed to last for multiple years um, and irrigation, uh, whether it's drip lines or some kind of emitters are generally, uh, for the most part, ran above this stuff. So um, black plastic mulch, we do have some data on that on how it impacts soil temperature. And black plastic mulch heats the soil through conduction. So that means that the, as the black plastic mulch is hugged against the soil, uh, the heat from that black plastic mulch that comes from the sun um, is transferred into the thermal mass of the soil. So this heats uh, best when it's tightly formed to the bed. And if you've ever seen a video of uh, this stuff being laid, it's almost stretched over the top of the bed. Um, so we can see here, how does that impact soil temperatures? So black plastic mulch, if we look at the top here, there's bare ground. Um, so the average soil temperature and bare ground at two inches um, was 76 uh, for a low and 100 for a high, whereas our black plastic mulch was 80 for low and 109 for a high. So you can see the maximum is nine degrees higher than bare soil. Um, just as a general rule of thumb, very general, uh, soil microbes are most active from 65 uh, to 80 degrees. Now, landscape fabric, there's really not a lot of available data that I could find for soil temperatures under landscape fabric. Because it's not installed to where it's really tightly hugging the beds, it's probably likely less of an elevation in soil temperature because the conductive ability just isn't there when it's not tightly formed to the bed. Um, if organic mulches are used on top, that will um, block the sunlight and reduce the soil temperature. So we do have data on black plastic mulch, but not so much on landscape fabric. Uh, some considerations with using landscape fabric. It is going to degrade over time. It's not a secret weapon to fight weeds. It can help greatly, but weed seeds will be blown in over time. Uh, if you have organic mulch on top and the weed seeds blow in, they can germinate and establish. Aggressive weeds do have the ability to push through this stuff from the bottom or root through it from the top. Um, if you do have to remove it, it can be very difficult to remove and get all the materials under there, uh, all the materials out of the soil. Um, because there's not organic matter degrading on the soil surface when this mulch is installed, there can be some degradation of soil structure over time. Um, and without the organic mulches on top, you do have uh, a, the microclimate around the plants will be elevated in temperature, even though it's not as tightly hugging the soil as black plastic mulch. So what really impacts soil ecology and soil microbial communities? So things like soil moisture, soil temperature, uh, vapor exchange. So, you know, the gases that are produced in the soil, are they able to go upward? Are the gases in the atmosphere able to interface with the soil? And also the, pres the presence of plant roots. So there's lots of things that impact um, soil ecology. And when we think about soil ecology, that's not just the microbes, the fungi and the bacteria, um, but also some of our uh, invertebrate arthropods um, and other higher level organisms like protozoa. So I did look at some, uh, some data that some work had been done on this. Um, Black plastic mulch can decrease the population of soil invertebrates. So I showed a picture of springtail and other arthropods. It can decrease their population. This is black plastic mulch. Keep that in mind, not landscape fabric. Um, because it does raise the soil temperature, soil microbial activity is actually increased in the early part of the season when the bare ground soil temperatures are cooler. Um, but it is decreased during the hottest part of the season. Um, and there's also some impacts related to soil moisture and whether sunlight is on that soil or not. Uh, the short answer is it's complicated. 
Um, it might be favoring certain parts of the soil food web and negatively impacting other parts of the soil food web. Um, you know, the temperatures are two inches deep, so the soil temperatures are going to be lower the deeper you get. So I think the, the short answer is it has impacts on soil ecology and soil microbial communities, but what those impacts are and how that affects plant growth is not fully understood. Um, black plastic mulch and vegetable production systems has been around for a long time, and it has been shown to increase yield of vegetable crops. Organic mulches, however, um, we always encourage folks to use organic mulches. Uh, I found some data from Michigan State that said there is an 18 degree reduction in soil temperature versus bare soil, uh, kind of in that midsummer, midday time. If you're using landscape fabric with organic mulches on top, as long as those organic mulches are fully blocking the sunlight, you're probably dealing with reduced soil temperatures in that system as well. Organic mulches also help moderate fluctuations in soil, sorry, moderate fluctuations in soil moisture um, as the soil is not drying out as quickly after a rainfall or irrigation event. These organic mulches do feed soil organisms and you don't have to worry about legacy materials um, like landscape fabric that gets broken apart and plastic fibers that end up in the soil over time. This question was specifically related to establishing a site for a prairie, and I put some links in our file there that Debbie will drop in the chat box. Um, a couple different ways people establish a site for a prairie. You're thinking about weed control, so a common, probably the most common way to do it on a large scale would be a burn down with the herbicide. But folks will also use tarping, um, where they're using some kind of light blocking material just to kill the existing weeds and plants with shade before they're establishing um, prairie crops or natives by seed or by planting. And then uh, another way which probably isn't uh, necessarily as beneficial to soil structure is just repeated cultivation. We call that a bare fallow, um, where you're just for a whole season, you're basically cultivating the weeds as they come up. And I think cover cropping could also be a part of that, but that's a topic for another time. So that's all I got, Jennifer. All right, thank you, Justin. Our next question deals with flower pots and containers. And the question is, I bought two large flower pots. If I fill them with dirt, they will be too heavy for me to lift or move. My question is, can I put something in the bottom of the pot to take up some of the space that would be lightweight without having to fill the whole pot with potting soil? I would probably only ever plant annuals in it for the summer, so their roots would never grow very deep. And Debbie is going to answer this question. Yeah, so this is a really interesting question, um, and there are a lot of different folks that have lots of different answers. If you look on the internet, and we all know everything on the internet is, is accurate, right? Um, so just doing some research on this topic, seeing what really is recommended according from research-based information, and there's lots of information out there uh, that it's not so research-based. So let's talk about some of this stuff here. And so one of the things that we want to look at is, first of all, the soil that's in those containers. There is a specific type of soil that you want in those containers because you're not actually growing in the ground. Containers have a tendency to dry out much quicker. And so we, we liken that soil to have uh, some different sort of soilless um, mix that's in there that can help to hold and retain some of that water. So soils uh, for containers need to be, they have to also be very well aerated because we want to have that air in the soil because the roots do need air as well. But we also need to make sure that there is some sort of a hole in the container towards the bottom so that excess water can go ahead and drain out because if that container gets solid full of water, you're essentially drowning those plants. So using a potting mix for containers, also known, known as a soilless mix. Some of the advantages of that is that it's lightweight. Uh, so if you have large containers, it's good for that, especially if you're gonna be moving them around. Also these uh, potting mixes will have 
some way of being able to retain some moisture so that you don't have to water them as frequently, but you do need to check them and engage, especially with the type of plants that you've got in it. Some plants like more water than other plants. So after a little bit, you'll learn what that is and make sure that you water your, your plants correctly. And then of course, make sure you have plenty of air space um, in that pot as well. So you don't want it to be so compacted down. So some of the things that I, I read out there um, that you could use as fillers, which um, research is really saying don't do it. Uh, people have taken milk jugs, water bottles, wood chips, pine cones, leaves, sticks, newspaper, cardboard, straw, hay. Sometimes they'll take a plastic pot and turn it upside down. Um, plastic grocery bags, when I saw that listed as a potential filler, I just kind of cringed. I'm like, that would just keep the water in. There's no holes in those plastic bags. So I was really concerned with that. Crushed cans, wood logs, broken pieces of ceramic and bricks, large rocks, cinder blocks. I was like, oh my gosh, if it's a cinder block, it's gotta be a huge. Packing peanuts. And I'm just reading all this information. I'm like, I know that's not right. So when you guys do search on the internet, make sure that you're looking for some legitimate information, uh, making sure that it's, it, the website ends with an edu because um, you know it's going to come from a university um, dot gov government entities and there are some good nonprofits out there that also do some great research as well so just be careful when you're looking for information on the internet so one of the reasons why we want to take into consideration especially with with our containers is what we call a perched water table people years ago and I was guilty of it as well until I learned better. Uh, they would put lots of gravel on the bottom of the pot just simply because they didn't want their soil to get out of those holes. And then essentially what you're doing is this area is going to be filled with water. Then you're going to have more water that's going to be on top. Yes, all of this is going to be soil, just like it is over on the, on the left side. That's all soil. But your roots don't have very a uh, distance to grow before they get to a section of the pot that's going to be saturated with water. And so our plants are going to be overwatered and they're not going to grow well and have a tendency to go ahead and die. Remember, overwatering as well as underwatering can cause a plant to wilt. And so you need to keep that into consideration. So we want to make sure that we don't create this water table. We want to make sure we fill it and we don't, you can cover up, put one or two rocks maybe on top so that there is good drainage that's going through and comes out the bottom. But essentially, we don't want to create a perch water table. Another example is if you take just a regular sponge, you get it wet, you set it flat on a table, some of the water is going to come out of that. But then if you take that same sponge and turn it on its end, so it's more of a vertical instead of horizontal, more water is actually going to drain out of that sponge. So essentially what you're doing is you're creating that sponge-like concept of when it's wet and you're laying it flat on, the, on a table or a surface, it has more water in it than if you turn it on its side. And essentially that's what's happening when you're putting lots of things in the bottom of a container. So let's look at what can you actually do with containers that are large, especially those that you know that you're going to have to lift and move. One thing to do is go ahead and fill it, put it where you're going to keep it permanently and then fill it. Or if you're going to move it around, then there are some things that you can do. You can create a shallower container within that larger container. So one of the things that you can do is take, make sure you have at least nine inches depth for those roots to be able to grow in that container or deeper if, if possible. Get a, a customized cut, a piece of plywood that fits on the inside of that pot. So essentially you're making the inside of that large pot a much smaller pot itself. But again, that nine inch depth minimum for those plants to grow in that container would be great and ideal. Make sure you create a drainage hole in that plywood that you're gonna put as a level, as like another table on the inside of that large pot because we want the water to go through the soil 
through that drain hole in the, in the uh, plywood and then down into the bottom of that pot and out. If you need to, you can actually, if it's a, it's a pot that's large enough, tall enough that might blow over in a wind, you might wanna put some kind of a larger stone in the bottom underneath that plywood, but you don't wanna cover up any, any of those container holes in the very bottom of that container. So just be careful with, with what you do put underneath of it, that piece of plywood. Another thing that you could do is, is put a pot within a pot. And I have actually done this myself. So I'm putting some different materials that are gonna be on the bottom of that larger pot that we might be able want to use. And then on the sides of that pot, the smaller pot that goes inside the larger pot, I will go ahead and put some soil around that. And then I'll make sure that, that my smaller pot is right at that top level of the soil. And that way you can actually fill that bottom of that pot with some sorts of things, such as what the filler was when I listed it on that previous slide. Uh, you can put some of those sorts of things in there. So water bottles, make sure you put the lid on that water bottle, some of those other materials. But the bottom pot also must have a hole in it in as well, because the smaller pot's gonna have a hole and drain its water down. So just be careful with how you put one pot into another pot. Those items that are gonna be on the bottom, make sure that the hole is not covered and that that uh, material in the bottom actually will allow water to drain out should the smaller pot go ahead and, and it let the water from it into that larger pot. So good luck and I hope this helps. Thank there you, is, Debbie. Oh, sorry, there is one question, Debbie, and it is, can you use smaller rocks that are arranged for good drainage? Um, you don't wanna create a, a, a water table, perched water table. That's what you want to avoid. So if you've got a larger container where you're gonna put a pot inside of a pot, you can use those rocks on the bottom put your plant, the smaller pot on top of that, and then put the soil around the smaller pot if it's not um, as wide as the um, larger pot that you've got. Um, we just really wanna be careful that we're not covering up that water hole in the bottom of the larger pot. Um, if you need to add some stones in there for the weight so it doesn't blow over. Hopefully that answers the question. All right, any other questions, Kathy? No, but there are good resources in the in the uh, chat as well for this for this question. Okay, so we'll move on to our next topic. And if you grow chrysanthemums and asters, you probably should have been pinching them since mid May. And I'm going to talk about pinching those plants and, and why we need to do that. Oh, and Debbie, I'm having the same issue I had this morning. I have these PowerPoints open and they're not showing on my computer. You want to send it to one of us, uh, Jennifer, and we can show it and uh, we can move on, I guess. And then uh, a little bit oh. later, one of us could show it. You know what? I've got it. I've got it now. I pushed okay, the button and now I've got it. Okay, here we go. All right. So again, if you've grown asters, you know that they can get tall and leggy if you don't pinch them back. And they're also beautiful plants and they attract a lot of pollinators. And I've grown asters for probably 20 years or more. And I grow them at the Adair County Extension Center here in Kirksville, as well as my home garden. And I love them. It's one of my favorite fall plants. And I love to watch the butterflies on them <clears throat> during the fall. But in order to get them to not grow so tall, I have to pinch them. And this is what an aster looks like that has not been pinched. You can see it gets about three, maybe three and a half feet tall and it starts falling over. And it doesn't have quite as many flowers as it would if it was a shorter, more compact plant. 
So this is what you don't want to have happen. Instead, you want to pinch your plants to make them smaller and more compact and to produce more flowers. And pinching is removing that terminal end of the stem and that diverts energy into the side buds. And what you're doing is you're pinching off the top two to three inches. And you can see that in this photo here on the, the left side. So when you pinch that off, you're going to, again, send energy out to the side buds, which is going to create a bushier, more compact plant. And you want to start doing this in mid-spring. When you start seeing the growth come on, the plant's really growing, you need to snap off that, uh, that foliage on the terminal ends. And on the right side, you see where it has been taken off. And I do that about every two weeks. And I'll do it through July 4th. And here is an aster that has been pinched. Notice that it's a lot smaller in size. You know, it's more compact. And they typically have more flowers than if you let them grow three and a half, four feet tall. I do the same with chrysanthemums. So we wanna pinch our chrysanthemums also when growth starts and when they really start uh, coming along in May. And you're gonna do the exact same thing. You're gonna pinch out the top two or three inches of the terminal growth like you see in these photos. And that too will make a smaller, more compact chrysanthemum plant versus a leggy plant. And I have let some of my chrysanthemums that have gotten, or that have overwintered, you know, I've got, I have some that are several years old. I have let some of them get tall and they too fall over. The flowers um, get heavy and they, they fall over. So to prevent that, you want to pinch them. And this is what will, this is the look you'll have if you do pinch. So you want a smaller, more compact uh, chrysanthemum plant versus a tall leggy plant. And that's all I have. Are there any questions? There are not. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. There is other flowers other than asters and mums that should be pinched. You know, there probably are. Those are the two that I grow that come to mind. Colleagues, do you have any others? Okay. Those are the main two that we grow that in our gardens that are perennials that produce a lot of flowers and that bloom in the fall. But if anybody thinks of one, just put it in the chat. Well, there is a couple more. Is it too late to pinch asters? And then also, should you pinch elderberry? Well, no, it's not too late to pinch asters. And you may want to pinch. So now, now they're probably three feet tall, going on two to three feet tall. And you can go ahead and pinch them, but you're going to probably want to pinch more than just two to three inches. You may need to pinch more like six inches. And I've already done it twice. So I will be on my third pinch and I'm gonna do that here in another week. So right around the 4th of July, I will do my last pinching for the season and then I'll just let them grow to produce flowers. But if you have not done that yet, you still can. Your stems may be a little tough, but uh, I would go ahead. Otherwise you're gonna have a tall leggy plant that may split and flop over in the fall. And then regarding elderberry, I grow elderberry, a lot of elderberry, and I've never done it with those plants. So I don't have experience pinching elderberry and I've never heard a reason why. Colleagues, do you, have you ever done it or know why we would? I, I haven't ever heard of that. Yeah, so we're gonna say no on pinching elderberry. I've grown elderberries for years now at my house and my office. We, I have a lot of them and they grow, well, I, I prune them down to the ground. You know, I do prune them to, you know, down to about six inches in February or March. And then I just let them grow and they're now they're starting to flower. Okay, we will move on. And squash bugs are a problem in most gardens as we go into late June and July, and a lot of people struggle with controlling them. And Justin is going to talk about squash bugs and how to, how to uh, control them in your garden. All right, thanks, Jennifer. So these pesky critters, um, if you haven't seen them yet, uh, you will definitely see them soon. Um, you can see there's kind of different stages of growth um, in this picture here. Uh, these go through a couple different metamorphoses, but let's um, let's dive in a little bit to this topic. Um, so the squash bug is in the order Hemiptera. This is also known as the true bug order. 
Um, so they have that shield shape to them, a um, little bit more than a half inch long. Uh, the adults can be dark gray to dark brown. You're probably familiar uh, if you've grown squash of these egg masses, um, which are going to be yellow to bronze. Uh, it does go through five different instar stages. Um, so after those eggs hatch, those squash bugs will go through five different stages and they all look a little bit different. You can see there's at least two or three stages uh, in this bottom picture. These guys do overwinter as adults. Um, they become active in the late spring and deposit egg masses and can be active um, throughout the growing season in Missouri. There's at least two broods, um, so two generations of, of this insect. The main crops that it goes after um, are squash and pumpkin. And I'm sure everybody that has a vegetable garden is at least planting um, some kind of squash. Uh, they can affect other crops, but if you have squash or pumpkin, they will go for those first. So they have needle-like mouth part, parts um, where they're extracting plant juices. And so this damage um, caused by this extraction can affect the flow of water and nutrients within the plant. So if this infestation gets very severe, um, you might notice these plants wilting, especially during the heat of the middle of the day. Um, as the plants become larger, they, more, they are more tolerant of feeding and feeding damage. Um, but these guys can be pretty tricky because they can hide under the leaves um, you know, when they're approached or the plants are moved, you might see them moving or hiding um, to get out of sight. Early detection is your best bet with, uh, with the squash bugs because they can reproduce and lay large egg masses pretty quickly. Um, so scouting the plants um, in your garden, your squash plants, looking under the leaves, looking around the base of the plant. Um, they're pretty easy to remove by hand when they're small. You can remove the egg masses or um, the young stages with duct tape, for instance. Uh, another thing that, that you can do, um, because they do like to hide, and I've, I've heard of people doing this where they'll take like a piece of plywood and put it in the garden next to their squash plants, and sometimes those squash bugs will migrate under that board. Um, during the evening and then you know they're basically concentrated where you could kill them a little bit easier. Another thing that you'll want to do in terms of cultural management is try to reduce uh, excessive plant debris during the growing season around your squash plants. You'll want to clean up debris at the end of the season to reduce the overwintering sites for the adults. Um, we always recommend organic mulches. Um, straw can be a little bit tricky with squash bugs because it's a really good hiding place for them, which can make control more difficult, especially if you're trying to do any kind of spray. So things like grass clippings, leaf mold, or landscape fabric may provide less hiding sites than uh, organic mulch like straw. Floating row covers work really well for ex excluding these pests. Um, if you're gonna keep them on, especially into the warmer months, it's suggested to use a summer weight fabric, which is much lighter than a row cover that would be used to protect plants from cold weather. You'll wanna put these on when you transplant the crop. Uh, the picture here shows hoops, but you can lay this stuff right on top of a squash plant. You will need to remove these at flowering, so pollination can occur. Um, it does also give you a little bit of season extension. So whether you're using row cover or not, um, getting a little bit earlier planting of your uh, squash so that it gets big before the squash bugs come can be helpful, but you do have to keep in mind frost dates and cold weather. In terms of insecticides, there's a number of different insecticides available to the home gardener that are labeled uh, for squash bug. The tricky thing is spray coverage. So you really got to get good coverage on the leaf. You got to get under the leaves. Um, and the insecticides are always most effective in the early generations of the squash bug. Anytime you're using an insecticide or any kind of pesticide, check the bee box on the label and see if there's any restrictions regarding the time of day, whether it can be applied to flowering plants and how to best protect our pollinators if you are gonna choose to use an insecticide. There are a lot of natural enemies um, of squash bugs, both the adults and the eggs. Um, 
I believe this is a fly laying eggs uh, on top of the egg. So the larvae will come in there and consume the, uh, the larvae on the inside of the egg. This little dot on the squash bug here um, is another parasite that will hatch. You can bring these uh, predatory wasps and parasitic flies into the garden with flowering plants. So the adults of both of these beneficial insects feed on nectar and they feed on nectar and then they try to find a host to lay their eggs um, close to the flowering plant. So buckwheat, sweet alyssum, fennel, sunflower, and mustard have been shown to be some of the most effective, what we call insectary plants. So we're manipulating the ecosystem with those plants to bring in these beneficial insects. Uh, another strategy, which actually um, there is some work done on this in Missouri, is the idea of trap cropping. And trap cropping is basically using a plant that's more attractive than the cash crop to bring the pests away from the cash crop. Blue Hubbard has been shown to be very effective for pulling uh, cucumber beetle, squash bug, and squash vine borer away from zucchini. Blue Hubbard exudes high levels of cucurbitacin, which is the olfactory compound that attracts the complex of pests in the, squa uh, in the squash crop. Uh, in order for this to be effective, the Blue Hubbard does need to be started earlier, um, whether that's as a seed in the field or as a transplant, so that you have a large Blue Hubbard that is releasing a lot of cucurbitacin, but also visually um, is a bigger plant and more likely for these pests to land on it. In a small area, you can also plant blue hubbards in pots if you don't have the area to add this kind of uh, perimeter trap cropping situation. You will have uh, a high density of pests on this trap crop, however, and you will need to control them. Otherwise, they will kill that trap crop and they will then get into your cash crop. Um, so this can be done on a small scale with physical removal, like we mentioned with that duct tape. Um, another option would to be use something like amidacloprid, which is a systemic insecticide that has a three to four week residual activity. Um, in this case, it's recommended to remove the blooms on the trap crop so that there's not any impact on pollinators. And there are also some uh, organic approved insecticides that are labeled for squash bugs. And that is all I got. All right, thank you. Good information. All right, I'm going to talk about garlic and onions and when to harvest. And a lot of people grow those in their garden and we are getting close to harvest time. Can you see that okay, Justin? Not yet. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay. All right. So let's talk about garlic and onions and when to harvest. I know a lot of people like to cook with garlic and onions and they do have health benefits. So when should you pull your onions and pull your garlic out of your garden? Well, the heads do need to be left in the ground as long as possible because you want to attain the maximum bulb size and the bulbs double in the last stage of their growth but you don't wanna leave them in the ground so long that the cloves start separating because then if you're selling them on a farmer's market, they won't sell well and they also store poorly. So you want to wait until they develop a good size, but you just can't leave them in the ground too long. So you harvest when the leaves begin to turn yellow, but when they're still about 60% green and we are about at that stage here in Northern Missouri. Southern Missouri may be a little farther along, so I'm going to be harvesting garlic probably in the next week. And it is better to harvest garlic too early than too late. And after you pull your garlic, you want to cure it for about two to three weeks in a dry, well-ventilated location. And some people braid their garlic or they hang it to dry in bundles. So you can do that, but you do want to, you want it to dry. If you leave it in the ground too long, this is what can happen. The cloves will start to split like you see here and they can also start to rot like you see in these photos. And I have had garlic that I left in the ground too long and then when I pulled it, it was 
brown. It had brown spots and really not usable. So that's why you don't want to leave it in the ground too long. So again, it's better to harvest too early than to wait and harvest it uh, at a later stage. Now, when to harvest onions? You also want to harvest them when the tops begin to turn yellow and fall over. And here in Kirksville, we are not there yet. My onion tops are still green. And when you pull those onions after they've turned yellow, or when they are turning yellow, you want to cure them first uh, before using them. You want to store them in a warm, dry, uh, well-ventilated location like your shed or maybe your garage. You want to spread your onions on a single layer, a uh, clean surface. You don't want to stack them on top of each other in a box and just put them in the garage and forget about them for a few weeks. They may rot and you'll come back to find some really mushy onions. So put them in a single layer in an area that's clean and dry. And then cure them for two to three weeks until the tops and the necks are thoroughly dry and those outer bulb scales are dry and they begin to rustle. And without proper curing, again, they will become soft and mushy and then you won't be able to use them. And this is what happens with onions if you wait too long to pull them. You will have mold and mildew growing on them. They will be mushy and you'll just wish that you had pulled them when they were starting to turn yellow versus when they were totally, the tops are totally brown. And if you have any questions on growing or harvesting garlic and onions, just reach out to one of us and we'll be glad to answer your questions. That's all I have on that. Okay, Japanese beetles are becoming a problem in Southern Missouri. And jo Kathy is going to tell us about Japanese beetles. Oh, let's, yes, thank you, Jennifer. And what great information about the garlic and onions. Um, yes, it is the season for Japanese beetles and we're seeing them uh, across the state. Um, uh, several colleagues told me they have uh, they have seen them and they've gotten reports of them. And uh, so I get questions this time of year about how to control them. And then um, and almost inevitably, someone will ask me about the traps. So just a little bit about the life cycle of the Japanese beetles. You probably you may have even seen this picture before. So they spend the majority of their life underground as a C-shaped um, uh, grub. And they uh, emerge May to June, this time of year, as adults. And they, they find the host plant and they, may, they mate and the females lay eggs in the soil within 30 to 60 days. Those eggs hatch. Um, 17, seven to 14 days and the grubs feed on the grass roots. Sometimes they'll really damage a lawn from uh, feeding on those roots. And they do that until about October and then they overwinter below the soil surface and the cycle begins again uh, next spring. So there are several different methods for control but traps are not usually recommended. Um, they actually attract more beetles than they capture. And so when they're uh, when they are coming in, they then they're going to land upon the plants that you were trying to protect. So this, if you haven't ever seen this, this is some of the damage that they can do. And um, so if you decide to use a trap, it is recommended to place it at least a hundred feet away from the plants you are trying to protect. Again, I'll emphasize that we don't really recommend using traps. Um, they can also fill up very quickly and they need to be emptied sometimes daily. They also um, don't smell very good. <laughs> and uh, so if I haven't convinced you yet, if you get a trap and you have to empty one, um, there's a lot of uh, wiggly, uh, writhing beetles, smelly on a, on a, a regular basis. Again, sometimes daily. And I had someone tell me uh, that they mistakenly tried a trap. They had to empty it every day, and the next year they did not use a trap. 
So some other ways you can control the beetles is if you start early um, and you don't have many, uh, you just hand pick them and drop them in a, in a bucket of soapy water. Now I try to, every time I go outside, I try to just have that uh, uh, soapy water with me. And I usually go out in the garden early in the morning and then in, I try again in the evening, just not just to be, be looking for Japanese beetles, but just because I want to see what's going on in my garden. And I've just been really trying to make a habit of having that soapy water uh, to go with me. You could also place a netting over your plants after the pollination is complete. You can um, uh, also, uh, they are very attracted to different, uh, there's specific plants they are very attracted to, and a lot of them are the non-native ornamentals like uh, crepe myrtle or um, knockout roses. So you can try planting more native species that aren't as attractive to invasive insects like uh, Japanese beetles. And you may decide to spray. Um, there are organic sprays, systemic sprays, and broad uh, broad spectrum sprays. And as we often say, whatever you decide to use, read and follow the label. You um, wanna make sure that Japanese beetles are listed uh, on the label as, as that uh, product to, to control Japanese beetles. Also, you wanna make sure that it's not gonna harm the plant that you um, are spraying it on. So those are just some of the ways that you can control, um, try to control Japanese beetles. And if you had more questions, it, every situation is a little different. So you can reach out to one of us. We can help you figure out what might be the mess, best uh, method for you. And that's all I have. Kathy, there is a question in the chat. Okay. Let's see. It's about grub you know, killer. Yeah, the grub killer. You know, I think that, and I, I would reach out to my colleagues here too and see if they have read anything as well. Um, I think that uh, it's possible that it could be effective. However, not one method is going to control all Japanese beetles. For one thing, they fly. Now we're not talking about the grub stage there. One For one reason, they fly. So if if I spray and my neighbor doesn't, um, then they may fly, fly over to mine. But I know there are some uh, grub killers for the lawns. I'm really not sure that um, the research is showing that, they're, it, that it's that effective. Does anyone else know? So there is a, um, I can't remember the scientific name for it, but there is a biological control called milky spore. Yes. Um, and it, it is effective for killing the grubs in your lawn. But like you said, Kathy, um, you could treat your whole landscape and still be infested with Japanese beetles because they can fly uh, from miles away. So um, I guess it might be effective if you're having turf damage. I haven't personally seen a lot of turf damage from Japanese beetles. So, you know, if you're not having turf damage, I would say don't spend the time and money doing it. Um, I haven't seen a lot of damage uh, on turf either. However, um, before I worked for Extension, I had a landscaping business oh. and someone asked me to do this in their yard and it was effective. I had forgotten about the milky spore and um, they were just, uh, the Japanese beetles were uh, decimating her um, uh, ornamental cherry. And so I applied it one year and for several years later, they they weren't coming around. And so um, I was, I wouldn't say that's the number one reason. I mean, her neighbor might've sprayed something, you know, they could have had a professional come in and spray their trees or something. But anyway, um, do your research and uh, call us if you've got questions. All right, thank you, Kathy. Yes. Now, Debbie has a horticulture term she's gonna go over with us. Yeah, I like doing this with you guys every time. So um, I have the, the horticulture term is called geophyte, a plant that grows in an abnormal pattern. 
a type of soil in which plants grow, plants with an underground storage organ. So if Jared can put, thank you, Jared, you're reading my mind. So if you guys wanted to select what you think the actual answer might be. Lots of answers coming in. Anybody else want to do it? It's anonymous, so if you get the wrong answer, no one's going to know but you. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll. I'm going to share the results. So 52% of you say that it is C, plants with an underground storage organ. 41% say that it's a plant that grows in an abnormal pattern. And 7% say it's a type of soil in which plants grow underground or plants grow, a specific type of soil that plants grow. So let me tell you what the real answer is. And it is C. A geophyte is a type of an herbaceous plant. Herbaceous plant means that it's succulent, that it's going to die back to the ground. It's not woody. Um, it could come back as a, as a perennial plant or it could be an annual. So the herbaceous plants with an underground storage organs rather than a fibrous root system and often clumped together, these different plants usually have what is called a bulb although a bulb is not always the correct term for these underground storage organs. So let's look at them. So we have five different kinds that I'm gonna to talk to you about today. So one is actually a bulb and it's made of a modified leaves or scales with a compressed stem and a basal plate where the roots emerge. So think of an onion or a tulip. So all of this, here are the roots of that. And this is actually modified stems. And then the leaves are gonna come up out here, right? So when you eat an onion, you're actually eating an underground stem. Another one is going to be a corm. A corm is going to be a storage structure that is a modified stem with a basal plate described as a solid bulb. So with, a, with this type of a bulb, we can actually pull and those layers off like with an onion, but with a corm, it's gonna be 100% solid. We can't, we can't take the slices off of it like peeling the layers of an onion, but it too, here are the actual roots and like an onion, there's always an end that you're gonna cut off, right? So that's the um, basal plate. And then here's the actual modified stem. So these are modified leaves. This is a modified stem. And here are little cormets, as I call them. And so those are actually, you can pull those off, off and have new plants. Examples are gonna be a crocus or gladiolus. We also have rhizome. A rhizome is a modified stem that grows horizontally at or just below the surface. So here's a picture of lily of the valley. And so we see the plant, the leaves coming up. And this actually is right there at the ground level. And that is going to be, this might be iris. So this is actually going to be um, the modified stem. So examples are the German lily and lily of the valley. And then our irises are the same. Then we have two more. We actually have a tuberous roots. And this here is a picture of a dahlia root. So it's a thickened root tissue. The growth arises from the buds at the top of the crown. So here's the crown. Actually here, you have these bulbets that are coming out. These are tuberous roots. And so we actually have examples of a dahlia, carrots, beets, any of our root crops that we have a tendency to eat like that, such as the beets and the carrots, um, turnips are gonna be a tuberous root. And then we have what is called a tuber. A tuber is a thickened underground stem with no basal plate. So it doesn't have any little types of roots. It could um, have it, but it doesn't have that basal plate where those roots are coming off of like we do with an onion. Remember if you slice off or cut off the very end where the root system is actually coming out of the onion, that's the basal plate. So it's just a solid 
underground stem, and examples are going to be potatoes and caladiums. So I bet you you didn't know you were eating underground stems, underground leaves when you were eating some of our vegetables. Thank you, Debbie. And it is noon, so it is time to wrap up and I'll turn it back over to Justin. All right, thanks, Jennifer. Um, join us every Wednesday throughout the growing season. We always like to get your questions and you could submit them at the link there uh, on the slide. Um, always happy to get your questions and pictures are always helpful as well. A um, lot of good links in the chat box here. So if you hover over these three dots next to the smiley face, you can uh, save that chat and come back to it and all those materials for future reference. As I mentioned earlier, we have horticulture specialists across the state, always happy to answer any of your questions. So if you haven't connected yet with your local horticulture specialist, um, you can jot down their email. And uh, if you have other folks in the community that have gardening questions, we can be a resource for them as well. Uh, if you submit a question, it'll pop up a form like this, um, and then you'll get an email bounce back and you can attach any photos and photos are super helpful. We like to have them around for future teaching opportunities. And at that, I will let uh, every, <laughs> and at that we are done and I appreciate everybody joining us and look forward to having you join the garden hour again.